Hi, everyone, and welcome to this program titled Dispelling Myths About Progestin-Only Birth Control. I'm Dr. Allison Edelman, a professor in OBGYN at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, and I'll let Dr. McDonald Mosley introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Reagan McDonald Mosley, the CEO of Power to Decide, and I'm super excited to be here with Allison hosting this session today. Such a pleasure to be here with Reagan as well. Okay, so today we're discussing some common myths related to progestin-only birth control pills. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about birth control access and why it matters. Reagan, you probably have some thoughts on that. Yes. While we know that there have been huge advancements in access to contraception, thankfully largely due to the Affordable Care Act, making it more affordable, as well as due to novel service delivery methods like over-the-counter telehealth access and now over-the-counter access, we also know that significant barriers remain for people to be able to access the contraceptive method that they want and need. And of course, we know the consequences of not being able to access the method that someone wants, including consistently high rates of unintended pregnancy in the United States. Our research at Power to Decide has demonstrated that despite advancements in coverage and care delivery, more than 19 million women live in contraceptive deserts, meaning that they live in areas where they lack access to health centers that have the full range of contraceptive methods. And of those 19 million women, 1.2 million women live in areas without access to a single health center that offers the full range of methods. And we know that there's been extensive research done on barriers to access to contraception. And a few notable ones to mention today are cost or lack of insurance, you know, our insurance system often means that it's tied to someone's employment, and many people unfortunately face gaps in their employment, meaning that they have lack of coverage for the method that they may have been on for a long time. Also, not having a regular provider or a health center to go to can get in the way of care or finding a trusted provider. And even if someone has a provider in their area or knows of one, many people find difficulty making an appointment with long wait times or arranging child care or arranging travel to their appointment. And we know that even when people have insurance, they often face denials for newer or more extensive methods. In fact, at Power to Decide, we published a report on this a couple of years ago that showed that many health insurance companies are denying the method of someone's choosing even after they get a prescription from their provider. And that can lead to them going without a method or having to choose a less effective method or a method that they're not super excited about. So Allison, in thinking about all of these barriers to access to contraception, can you tell us a little bit more about the progestin-only pill and the potential of what over-the-counter access to birth control might mean? Sure. Well, it may seem a bit obvious from the name, but progestin-only pills only contain progestin, so there's no estrogen component in these pills, and that makes them extremely safe for almost anyone. And I think what pill comes to mind the most for us because it's just been around for decades is Micronor, which you can see here on the left. But we also have two newer progestin-only pills, Slind, which contains Trispirinone, which is prescription only, and then Opil, which contains Norgestrel, which is available without a prescription over the counter. You'll see that the Drispirinone pill has some placebo days while the other two are continuous methods and you take an active pill every day. The progestin-only pills work by thickening cervical mucus, thinning the lining of the uterus, decreasing tubal motility, and they can suppress ovulation. And in fact, these newer pills are higher doses of progestin, and so they have more capacity to suppress ovulation. So with that, let's get to some common myths that we hear in our practice. One myth I hear a lot is that progestin-only pills aren't as effective as combined pills, and they're less forgiving if taken late. And as we discussed, we now have three progestin-only pills available in the US. And again, the one that we're most familiar with is Micronor. And Micronor contains a lower dose of progestin, and it's why we call it the mini pill. And it is less forgiving, so it can be less effective, especially if you're having adherence difficulties. The newer pills, Slind and Opil, have higher progestin doses, similar actually to a combined pill, and in studies appear to provide ovulation suppression. Slind, the Drospirinone pill, is considered late after 24 hours, and Opil has the same instructions right now as Micronor, three hours, but in a study looking at the risk of ovulation with Opil, being late or missing a dose didn't appear to put users at increased risk for ovulation. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to take it on time. It just means that you don't have to be perfectly timed for these newer pills to work for you. Reagan, what do you think about the common practice or myth of only using these pills for postpartum use? 
Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that one up. I mean, while it is true that progestin-only pill is a great method for postpartum contraception because it doesn't contain estrogen and therefore we worry less about the risk of VTE, also uh, it's a good method for folks who are choosing to breastfeed um, for the same reason that it doesn't have estrogen. But it's not only for postpartum contraception, right? Many of us were sort of trained to believe uh, or trained in our practice that we um, prescribe progestin-only pills or encourage use of progestin-only pills only if there's a contra contraindication to estrogen. But truly, progestin-only pill is a suitable method for anyone who wants it, not only people who have contraindications or reasons why they shouldn't use estrogen. In fact, it's important to note that in many countries where providers have adopted different practice habits, progestin-only pills are often a first-line contraceptive option rather than just one prescribed if someone has a contraindication to estrogen. In fact, progestin-only pills are commonly used in Sweden and in other Scandinavian countries, as well as in the UK, India, and in some uh, sub-Saharan African countries as well. So I also hear concerns that the public isn't able to adequately screen themselves in terms of using a pill over the counter. So we wanted to address that one. And it's a good reminder that uh, there's been extensive research, including the label comprehension studies and the actual use trials that were done by the company that submitted the over-the-counter switch application to the FDA for O-Pill that showed that people can absolutely read a label or use a checklist and determine whether or not the over-the-counter progestinally pill method is safe for them to use. It's also important to remember that there are very few contraindications to a progestin-only pill, and Allison will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So Allison, what about concerns that people will be less adherent to an over-the-counter birth control pill? Yeah, it's funny, Reagan. It seems like all these myths, the actual reality is the exact opposite. You know, taking a contraceptive method consistently and correctly is key to how well it's going to work for you to prevent pregnancy, no matter the method. But life's complicated and no one is perfect. But research has shown that the users of an over-the-counter pill can take the pill as directly and they know what to do if they miss a dose. And in fact, we know that people, when they can choose their method, when they like their method, when it's accessible to them, they'll take it. And sometimes our healthcare system and us as providers actually make it harder for patients to be adherent. We can actually change the way that we can that we write prescriptions. There's great research showing that providing a year's worth of pills helps. And what I mean by that is instead of writing a prescription for one pack with 13 or 12 refills, you actually write it for 13 packs. And we do know that we still have insurance covered it's challenges throughout the US in different areas around this, but in other states, they've gotten this fixed and you can give everybody their whole year's worth at once. And we know that pills available over the counter also help in countries where um, over the counter pills are available. We have good research that patients use it um, for prescription lapses or if they're waiting for their pharmacy to get their prescription. And then also it enables patients to start a method safely on their own when they need it. Um, just meeting some of those needs that Reagan mentioned earlier that people are having challenges getting into the healthcare system. So it's great to have a highly effective method that's over the counter. The other thing we often hear about is safety. Um, for example, one common concern with progestin-only pills is that increased risk for irregular bleeding and that the irregular bleeding is dangerous. And like many contraceptive methods, progestin-only pills usually do cause a change in the menstrual pattern. And this is okay. It's not unusual to see that irregular bleeding and usually it's light. This is expected and not dangerous. And as mentioned earlier, each of the POPs is a little bit different. So Micronor and Opil have no placebo week or period week. So you're taking an active pill every day, and it just depends how your body's responding to what your bleeding pattern is. So if you're, take, you're taking 28 days of active pills, and then you go right to the next pack without a break. SLIND is a 24-4 pill. So you have 24 active pills and four placebo pills, which may help some people have more regular bleeding cycles um, when taking it. But again, just a reminder, many individuals taking progestin-only pills won't have a period at all or rarely, and this is okay or, and normal unless you're worried about a pregnancy.
And then an another myth I hear is that progestin-only pills aren't a good method for adolescents or patients with certain medical conditions, when in fact, progestin-only pills are an incredibly safe option, no matter an individual's age, and actually even safe for most people with medical conditions. Obviously, if you're pregnant, you shouldn't take the pill, you don't need them, and if you have a current or re uh, recent breast cancer. And then there are some medications that may make them less effective, but these drugs are not common, like tuberculosis medications. So Reagan, I do hear some providers say over-the-counter pills are a terrible idea because then people won't come to me for the other care I provide. What do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, in full transparency, this is something that I was concerned about too when I first learned about the pill, the potential for an over-the-counter pill years ago. But I became less concerned when I learned about the research that, that has been done that has shown that even when people do have access to an over-the-counter pill, they continue to see a provider for other methods that require a prescription or for other routine health concerns or needs like cervical cancer screening, breast screenings, STI testing, et cetera. It's also a good time to remind folks that as guidelines are updated, our practices change over time. And thankfully, I would say more recently to become more person-centered, right? Like we used to require people to come into our offices to get cervical cancer screenings and pap smears, blood pressure checks, et cetera, before we would write them a prescription for birth control or renew their prescription for birth control. And protocols have changed to allow for telehealth and remote access to contraception, and now over-the-counter access is a continuation of thinking about what is truly necessary to ensure safety and centering the needs and desires of individuals and communities rather than providers and medical institutions, which I think is a really good thing. Lastly, I often hear you have to stay off the pill for X amount of time or you've been on the pill for a long time. You should go on a break. Um, so yeah, I'm super, I hear this one too a lot. <laughs> it's a really common one. And I'm super excited to be able to put this myth to bed pill breaks are not evidence-based and really leave people at risk for unintended pregnancy. Um, it's important to remember that the physiologic changes that happen when people start taking the pill often ha happen in the first weeks to months, right? So it makes zero sense for someone to potentially see those risks in the first few weeks or months that they use a pill, be on it for a number of years, and then stop only to restart and then re have to experience those physiologic change changes that could put them at risk, right? Moreover, we know when we look at sort of all-cause mortality for people who use the pills that it's actually the same or lower um, in most studies compared to non-pill users because there are a lot of non-contraceptive benefits of using the pill, including lower rates of certain types of cancer, including ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer and colon cancer. So pill breaks, again, are not evidence-based and put people at risk for unintended pregnancy, and we should not be recommending that people stop a method if you know it's working for them and there's no other reason for them to stop it. Well, Reagan, this was super fun. Thanks for joining me today for this great discussion. And a big thank you to all of you for choosing to spend some time with us today. I hope this was useful to you. Thanks, Allison. This was super exciting.